now and then the historic hundred. And we want to welcome Paul Thorpat and Jean Sherard, who are the authors. And you probably know know the work from uh, the Sunday Times. They do the weekly Seattle now and then. And I will read what Amazon has as a description of the book. It says, a new and inspiring compilation of a lifetime of documenting the city's heritage by Seattle public historian Paul Dorpat. The most compelling and essential of Paul's 1800 photo history columns for the Sunday magazine of Seattle Times. Each stunning then image is paired with a new matching full color now photograph by John Sherrard. He also is Clay here. I want to thank Clay for his assistance in arranging this whole presentation. And gentlemen, the floor is yours. Thank you. Clay, Clay is also our, our editor. So okay. he, he went over the book with a fine tooth comb and, and, and worked. Paul says that's a cliche. And I, so I will apologize because I'll use at least six more and he will call me on each one of them. I'm calling <laughs> every one of them. Every one of them. Yeah. Because Paul never uses cliches. Rarely. And also, I think, may I add something? I think the thing that you read from, what is the name of that company? The Amazon. What do they do? I don't know. They're just kind <laughs> of anyway, a mail order company. That sounds familiar to me. I think I know who wrote it. I think I know who wrote it. You did? That guy right well, over that there. That guy. <laughs> yeah. So he insinuates himself anywhere, including with your group. He got you to invite us here. Right? Anything to sell he books, called you right? up and, yeah. and got you to invite us. Now, how often do you guys have meetings? Oh, Four times a year. Yeah, two or three times a year. Two or three times a year. Okay. All right. Well, let's let's proceed. This book is, as you read in the introduction, it's made up of uh, around a hundred subjects of the eighteen from the eighteen hundred columns that Paul's written since nineteen eighty-two. What you're about to see is the very first column he did in January seventeenth of eighty-two. This is the very first of 1800. And here it is. We're now looking at 1919, the homecoming parade for the 63rd Coast Artillery back from the First World War. Here they were. And it was a citywide celebration. They broke out the flags. It, was, uh, it actually is, is suited to this time of year, as we've just celebrated the 100th uh, anniversary of Armistice Day. And uh, I went back there about a year and a half ago on January 21st, 2017, and shot the largest parade in Seattle history, which was the Women's March. So let's look at Paul's. Can I interrupt, please? Yes, please. How many of you guys went to the Women's March? How many of you were there? Clay was there. Any of the others? I was getting paid. That's working. That's right. I was getting paid also. Okay. You were there then. We were transporting these people there. Yeah. yeah. They needed the buses, I know, because I had to walk home after taking them. I was there. So we want to thank you for that. This is the original photo that Paul took in 19, the fall of 1982. His Seattle Times column started after he created a, um, a book called 290, how many? Four. 294 glimpses of Seattle, and it sold 30,000 copies? Well, I say 40,000, but I remember you, you, you said no, you didn't think that could be. I didn't That's think there were 40,000 people in Seattle in 1982. Well, it wasn't 1882. Oh, it was 1982. Okay, so that's... I think that's true. That, that's what we... So you know how many books you publish, because you've got to order them from the printer. So it's not hard, if you're honest, to say how many there are. But the truth is, a lot of people are not honest, especially in publishing. 
they exaggerate their importance. <laughs> and we might have done that too. I don't think we did though. Well, regardless, Paul spent about four decades charting the changes in Seattle. And uh, in fact, I think you guys are probably more familiar with those changes than most everyone else who s stays in their rut because you wander around the city all the time. So you see the buildings going up in, 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 with such speed and alacrity that, that uh, you probably are, um, are even more shocked than we are. I don't know. I, I find myself uh, kind of surprised when I walk through neighborhoods that no longer exist. So, well, let's go on. We're going to now jump to the deepest snow ever in Seattle in 1880. Oops, sorry. This is from the book. This is the page from the book. That's not the deepest snow. So that's what the book looks like. That's our first page. Everything is in sequence. What, what our mission is is to try to find what those changes are and find also how, how, um, how the city has grown over the last 150 odd years, but also how, uh, where it's going. So we're, we're kind of looking at signs as we... In that this would book. be to hell. Could be to hell. Could be to hell. But we won't be there to know it, will we? <laughs> so here we are. Ooh, before the deepest snow, I threw in a slide, which is a preview of a column which is coming in the next maybe two and a half, three weeks. Oh, my It is. It is. Thank yeah, you, it's trolley. We thought you guys would appreciate Peter. this. It has never appeared in a column Oops. thus far. It's a photo that uh, if you. Uh, well, it's looking up, actually, Occidental. Yep. Okay, yes, sir. Major urban buildings on the right. Yes, it is. Just and big. now, of course, the sinking ship garage. So let's take a look at it today, if you can tear your eyes away from those lovely trolleys. Here we go. Yeah. And there it is today. This is our friend and French photographer, Baron Jean Lamont, who shares a passion for historical photography, and she's a damn fine uh, photographer of Paris and, and uh, many of its features. And can you hear him okay? Yeah. yeah. If you can't, move up, because I'm not talking about I don't know why you this. guys are back there anywhere. You can run up here. Yeah. 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 It's because I didn't take a bath. That's why, Paul. Well, I took I no bath know. last night. I don't think you did. All right, so here we finally come to the deepest snow. 1880. The snow fell for eight days. Boy, is he pissed. And in eight days, 64 inches fell. I know you guys know that when we when we had about four inches, that was the end of the administration of uh, of Greg Nichols because he didn't <laughs> he didn't get enough snow plows for you guys. Am I right? Yeah. Didn't have any snow plow. Yeah. He had no snow plows at all. That's why we had plows. We had plows. We didn't have any drivers to drive the plows. <laughs> Driver plows, and I know. Uh, you know, Nichols should have been, he should have been down on the street. In fact, I saw him on the streets with a shovel. I was down on 2nd Avenue shooting, and there was Greg trying to shovel buses out of the snow. And oh, wait, wait a second. Greg is an old friend of this guy right over here. He's a West Seattle guy, too. Let's have, let's have Clay tell us what he knows about the snow that, that stopped Destroyed on Nichols. the mayor. Paralyzed Clay? Seattle. Paralyzed Seattle, three days of, well, this paralyzed Seattle for weeks on end. Yeah. Oh, Gene's right. Yeah, I mean, the big snow did Greg in. I mean, the, the idea was that he had people uh, plowing the streets around his neighborhood just a couple blocks from where I live, but he didn't have them plowing the thoroughfares. Is that true? That's what I read in the paper. <laughs> <laughs> Well, didn't we discuss this with him, your old friend, Mr. Nichols? Some things are a little sensitive, you know? Okay, okay well, in, we'll finish this show in about six hours. So. <laughs> we'll, if, we'll pause for every slide. We'll ask each one of you what you think. But until that point, let's go forward now. We're going to look at my repeat of this photo. In the last snow we had in Seattle in 2017, I ran down to First and Cherry. Ooh shot up the street and look at those big fat snowflakes. It, it, it didn't stick. A couple people gathered some, uh, a little bit of snow and put it on fire hydrants and made snow. But that was about it. This is the closest we've come to, to a deep snow in the last several years. Here's the trolley overhead they've never used going up Cherry. Yes. 
trolley wire heads. Never used them. Not hot. No. Waterfront, of course. This is taken by the, the, the great Norwegian photographer Anders Vilsa, who was here for less than a decade before moving back to Norway. And he took several classic photos of, of Seattle uh, and, uh, and then returned to Norway to become sort of their national treasure, where he spent the next several decades taking uh, gorgeous photos in Norway. But while he was here, he took this marvelous shot of the waterfront. And of course, the waterfront is pushed out a little ways now, and you can see we're right about near the fountain today. Here he is again, looking down in 1898. This is the Yukon Gold Rush, and Vilsa is, with his back to Columbia, is nearly straddling the most westerly of the 16 rails, the eight tracks that crowd Railroad Avenue. You can see that most westerly rail coming down Railroad Avenue now Alaskan Way. And at this point, there were, in 99 days, 107 ships sailed for the Klondike in 1898. Some of them actually brought back a little gold, but not a lot of rich guys. And there we are today, right down at Coleman Dock. There's the Marion Street overpass where the pedestrians meander. Because you, if I don't shout, you say, can you all hear me? You just, you're, you, I can't win, Paul. Either I'm talking too loud or too soft. I don't hear you, what you're saying. That's yeah. what I'm talking about. Okay. <laughs> always giving me crap. Okay. That's not true. I'm not always giving him crap. Well, Ask Clay about that. Clay, am I always giving him crap? Oh, about 87% of the time. 87% of the time. Oh, that's not Norway actually published a series of stamps with Anders Vils's pictures in them, and I think they're absolutely glorious. Oh, here we go. Now I get to use my laser pointer. Let's look here. This is taken from the top of the Smith Tower a year before the public were allowed to climb, and uh, by a photographer for uh, who, who was right on the 35th floor observation platform, looking through the girders, skinless structure. And he could see up here Queen Anne, and there's Lake Union, and in the far distance where Paul lives, there's Wallingford. And down below, I can point out, there's the Rainier Club, and here's the Methodist Church, which still exists, the dome down here. And so watch this Rainier Club as we go to the next slide and see if you can find Lake Union in the distance here. So again, Rainier Club right there. Keep your eyes focused there. We're going to, we're going to follow it today. <laughs> there it is. Same vantage point, but I was looking through the, the bars. It is in focus, unfortunately. Paul worries about focus. But these projectors are crap. What can you do? They just, they only give you limited, you know, it's not like one of those LED screens. Why well, doesn't a big group like this that meets in a handsome building like this, and then has a fleet of expensive buses, why don't they have their own projector? Or a, a huge television screen, a great LED. Wouldn't that be fun? Because if the taxpayers found out about it, they'd have our heads. <laughs> they'd, be, they'd be pissed off. They up. only want buses from you, know. All right, that, what we just saw was the Monongahela escaping Lake Union in uh, probably early, late 31 or very early 32. No, late 31 it must have been. Because within, uh, so, and let's look at it today. This four-masted schooner had been in Lake Union for several years. And today we look at the Aurora Bridge. And there she is. Mm -hmm. no. How many of you have jumped from the bridge? Anybody? Yeah. Before oh, this you twin did? used it to go little... across that bridge. What's that? This yeah. twin used to go across that bridge a long yeah. time ago. Yeah, on the uh, George Washington Bridge, uh, the trolley service. Hmm. And yes, uh, the double trolley, double trolley, trolley, bus, bus, trolley buses. Here yeah. lead my career. You would go across there going into the thing. Wow. Or five, and six, and sixteen. No. <laughs> it was longer. Trolley bus buses. Well, let's, let's look a little further at the George Washington Memorial Bridge because, of course, this is the Taft Key, given to Taft in 1909 to 
Open AYP, which was our Alaska Yukon Pacific Exposition. Pacific Exposition. And it was our first World's Fair when Taft, it's, if you look, you can just see around the outside edges, blurrily Paul, I fear, if you look. <laughs> yeah, I'm looking. You're not. You're well, not. I know all these pictures. Okay. Right the so there's, there, it's studded with gold from the Yukon, with nuggets. Mm -hmm. So Taft pressed the button, opened the AYP. Well, the same thing, the same key was used for the next 50 odd years because the next person to use it for a Seattle event from Washington, D.C. was, of course, Hoover. Because on February 22, 1932, the 200th anniversary of George Washington's birth, they opened the George Washington Memorial Bridge, which we think of as a Roar Bridge, of course. And on this day, uh, an enormous crowd waited on either side of the bridge, and Roland H. Hartley, who was our governor at the time, and opposed deeply to the bridge because he was originally from, uh, I think he was from Everett, Gene, Everett. Okay. <laughs> we suggest that his opposition was because, or Paul feels it's provincial probably because from he was a provincial Everettian. Everettian? Oh, I know it. Imagine. You know it for sure? Yeah. He so was, he was he also like a, po a politician and a bit of a blowhard. Even though he was against the bridge, he was standing and speaking for uh, long gales of gustatory um, <laughs> self-praise and promotion, and, it, and he was interrupted by Herbert Hoover, remember that Taft key, in Washington, D.C., who was scheduled to press the key at 2.57 in the afternoon, and he pressed it, interrupting the governor of the state of Washington, and the crowds cheered, and the fireboats sprayed their great plumes, and the fireworks went off, and that flag unfurled, interrupting the speech of the governor, and Hartley never finished it. But the crowds, you can see, they were very enthusiastic. This was the engineering stress test for the bridge. Just to send the crowds out yeah. to see if it would come down. <laughs> That's good. And of course, I don't ask the way, but we can use that. Can we, can we use that? Paul wants to know if we can use that in our future shows. Why? We're going to tell them that according to you guys, that was an official stress test of the bridge. They were more willing to risk the lives of thousands is that okay? Can we say that? Just don't show any ducks up there. Okay. Quack. Ducks. 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 Here's Herbert the ducks. pressing the button. And of course, it was pressed once again. And this is the last time it was used to open a Seattle event, as far as we know. And there is John F. Kennedy with that same Taft key opening the World's Fair in 1962. <coughs> We have a page from the book uh, which features a young girl, Paula Dahl, who's on the left. She was the nine millionth visitor to the fair, and she was a VIP, and she won that enormous dog, and the everlasting enmity of her sister, who's right behind her there, who was nine million and won, and uh, they never, I don't think she was ever forgiven for that. Paul thinks I'm just being excessive here. I do know that. She, did you meet her? You know it. You know it. There she is standing with her class in Issaquah, and she's holding the nine million sign that she held as a child. She didn't know what happened to the enormous dog, though. She hid the sign from her sister, who continuously estranged and angry. <laughs> indicated she was going to tear it up of whatever came up. Boy, that doesn't look good. The family are first. So she. She guarded it and brought it out to this moment for Jean to take that photo and to hear her story of the family from tragedy. Is that it, Jean? That's it. You got it in one. So we're looking down Front Street, which of course was uh, is now First Avenue, and uh, every building in the picture, and I'm assuming the 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 pole in our in the foreground there. Uh, burned up, because this was the beginnings of the Seattle fire. There's Fry Opera House in the, up there in the, uh, the tallest structure in the kind of upper center left. And uh, it's between Marion and Madison on the east side, 
of Front Street or First Avenue. And today, you can see the infrastructure of the Front Street Cable Railway on the street. Yeah. Huh. On this one right here? No, no, on the one previous. previous. That's right. The rail there with the yeah, cable. That's right. And they, uh, they had to fix that because at, at, the, um, at the bridge, which was at Seneca, the fire uh, collapsed the front street. In other words, it burned up the street, so they had to stop the um, stop the trolleys for a day or two while they fixed it. Cable cars. Cable cars they were, yeah. Now I have a question regarding uh, these lights that are blinking. Why do they blink those lights there? The yellow ones? Yeah. Those are on the two, two shop trucks that are out, out there. So, oh, those? so buses don't run into them. Oh, okay. Shop trucks. Huh? Catch it, thank you. It's a, ca it's a caution. Yeah. Well, here's the day after. Now we're looking up at, at, a, at a very familiar location. Uh, and let's just go straight to it. You can see this, this front little doorway here, uh, which was actually, we can look past the Pioneer building, and we can see that it was the I, it was a bank. I thought it was the Occidental Hotel. Well, you're telling me that this was the Occidental Hotel. Gee, there. Sometimes I don't always tell you the truth. Oh, you lied to me again. Yeah. So it's a, <laughs> bank. it's a bank and a hotel. A bank and the a bank hotel. Had the main door off that uh, flat iron front, and the hotel, as you know, because you did it now and then on the hotel lobby. I did. Is behind it. So looking up, I guess we're looking at a hotel and a bank. This, of course, is the sinking ship garage and uh, Pioneer's building in the foreground. Uh, See, we're just talking about that little concrete thing there. And this is the Pioneer building. And, of course, right over here is the underground tour. But there's our lovely sinking ship garage. Why did we love it so? Let's go forward. Because it replaced this ugly bank. What do you think of that statement on Gene's part there? Would you incline to agree with that? <laughs> I like no. the hotel. Do you like the hotel or do you like the, uh, the parking garage? I like the hotel. Let's vote on it. Those who like the hotel, raise their hands. Those who like the parking lot, that modern parking lot, with all that wonderful air running through it, raise your hand. Well, most of Seattle no votes at all. Most of Seattle agrees with you guys because this was the Seattle Hotel in 1908, and uh, uh, we're in the middle of another uh, festivity, and it's um, it's still decades away from being torn down and replaced by that garage. But we return to that spot today, and we can see that the only. The only nice part of the sinking ship is it gives us a little bit more of our lovely Smith Tower. So we can have a view of the Smith Tower. But aside from that, it's there's kind of a bleakness there. And are they going to tear that down? No. Well, no, we don't, so they're gonna do it. we don't know. But, but someday it'll be torn down. Well, the sinking ship garage, though, uh, provided a, a major benefit to uh, right. To us also. Are you going to jump ahead in my okay, show? I'll, like I'll, I'll, I'll just I'll back up. Hey, why don't you come Do on you up? know? Did you know Victor Steinbrook? Uh, Wait, we're waiting for Victor somebody. Steinbrook. Come on down. I've been waiting for somebody like that. Come you. and tell come us what. Come here and tell us the story. Will you? No. Now, I, we know the story, but you're going to have to. You're going to. Now we're going to quiz you. You put yourself on the. Wow. Okay. Here we go. So before we go any further, Paul wants to call attention to the sensitivity. Of the designers. Look at that. Ooh. Look at that. See, we've got this basket, sort of basket oh, handle, it. basket handle design of the windows of the merchants. Look up there. They were so sensitive. They did the basket handles. In other words, they repeated the style of the of the, of the intersection or of the Romanesque of the Romanesque the style of the after the fire. And, uh, that they explained. That's this. It's, they explained that to, to indicate what good people they were. Sensitive. Now, Paul and I were both brought up by uh, religious people. So 
ours, our, our, our traditions are contain the story of sacrifice and sort of the, you know, the, the uh, how would you put that? The, the sacrifice of the Godhead was, a, was allowed us all to be rescued and saved. Well, in that same sense, as you were about to point out, the sacrifice of this particular Godhead allowed us to go forward and open, first off, in 1907, the Pike Place Market. I've and never heard him use that analogy ever before. Well, well I we thought I'd know. try it out tonight. So, uh, we had to lose the gorgeous Seattle Hotel so that we could gain a Pike Place Market. And who led that charge, sir? Victor Steiger. Do you have any comments to make about the salvation of the market? No, the, the only thing I, if you ever get a chance of the, with the sinking ship garage, uh, in the lower levels, you can actually still see some of the windows that have been cemented over that have looked, I don't know, underground in some capacity or other. Mm -hmm. it, it, some of that history still remains in the garage. You can see the traces of, you mean from the hotel? From the hotel, not as the market. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Really, they kept some of the, the they kept foundation of the hotel they tore yeah. down. I was. Oh, I never went to the very point, the lowest point. level because so of the you, rats. You can see it just walk, <laughs> when you walk down the other way past it. You can see it in there and see it on the. Uh, uh, I guess it'd be the James Street uh, right. side of the garage. Yeah. I'll take a look. Let's take a look at that now. Rats. We noticed you guys have got rats around here, in the parking lot there. And well, I think you were attacked. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Two legged ones. Ones. A bit more like ones. Yeah. It was. It was Okay, so let's look at the market today, of course, right down the center. And we did actually manage to save this place. And, it, and the preservation uh, was probably accomplished out of the grief and, and anger at having lost such a beautiful building in Pioneer Square. That was at least a fair part of it. Wouldn't you say, Paul? I love it. And I've got my name in uh, the list to be get housing here to end my life in the market or in a hospital after the market. Okay. Or perhaps on the floor, or perhaps in the street. So then your spirit can en engulf kills like the other ghosts. They can do what? Well, they got the ghost at kills restaurant. Oh, I don't know anything about that. Can you explain that to us, will you? Hmm? Explain that to us. What is it? Well, I think there's a ghost at kills restaurant in uh, Pike Place Market because it used to be a mortuary. That was near Kells. Yeah. Yeah. So you mean Kells, the, the, the Irish the Irish pub. No, I've I've heard about the ghost of Kells. I I kept hearing you say the ghost that kills. Kills. No, no, no. Kells. I was thinking the ghost that kills? No. I know, but I do I have heard about that. I had a, an actor friend who swore up and down that there was a ghost at Kells. His name was Glenn Mason, and he was a provisional IRA member, and he'd come out from his long nights of drinking and, and carousing and, and talk See about, us. tell ghost stories. So Paul can join him when the time comes. He can, uh, no, I don't believe any of that stuff, so they okay. wouldn't have me. No, they, they'd reject. So let's, <laughs> you guys should know this. This should be on your test for the entrance examination to become a. Okay, here's a test to you guys and gals. What is this? What is it? Come on. Take a guess. What year is it? Where are we? Mm -hmm. I don't know. Anybody? It's before the freeway. Oh, you're good. Uh, good, you're good. I've okay. never seen this picture. Right? Yeah, you probably did. Because it was in Paul's column only uh, about two years ago. So this is looking down the freeway. It was Melrose Place. <laughs> Uh, taken by a, a Swiss or German photographer named Werner Legen Hager, and he was a Boeing engineer who'd wander around town and take pictures. And he knew the freeway was coming, so he took that photo to, to capture it. Here is, um, where is this? What do you think this is? Let's take some guesses here. I'm going to take that Post now. office? It is. You got it. Third Union Post who Office. Said post office? Who said post office? Do you remember this post office? It was torn down in 58. I'm old enough. Well, well that's, that's good. Enough. That's good enough. People would say for about 50, 60 years, they'd say, meet me at the steps. And they, and they would all meet on these chuckanut sandstone steps. And the excuse for tearing it down was that the pigeons shot on the steps and made them 
uh, discolored and, and <laughs> ugly. So they replaced it with something beautiful and modern. Another garage. Now, I have a question to ask uh, of this group. Do you prefer the expression that the pigeon sat on this or pooped on this? Pigeon poop or pigeon sat? Let's let, raise your hands for pigeon poop. Poop. Poop? Okay, raise your hands for pigeon sat. No, oh, it's almost a tie. Is it a tie, is it? I think we have maybe one extra for poop. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Did you vote? No. Okay. Clay didn't vote. Clay? I know, Clay is so isolated. He's neutral. Sitting over there. Hooverville. Hooverville, taken from the B.F. Goodrich building in the mid-30s. It's about 250 out of 500 houses. And I call your attention, watch Smith Tower. And I went down with uh, the aid of the, of the port. And they gave me a, uh, uh, a lift. And I went up about 35, 40 feet in the air. And did you see Smith Tower? Watch it again. There we go. Same spot. Same spot. Yeah. It, it, they didn't move Smith Tower. They just no. moved Hooverville. Sure. Good point, Clay. <clears throat> Hooverville's back. It is, but we don't call it Hooverville today. We call it after our snowbound mayor. <laughs> Ten years later, we're still calling it Nicholsville. Are we really? We are. Yeah. Well, that must hurt. Me. Oh, this is a beautiful trolley. Oh, it is. Taken by a great trolley man. Exactly preserved. Right? Streetcar. Just before a streetcar, just before, of course, abandoned. they were abandoned and turned to uh, gas and oil. Three and trolley buses. buses. And trolley buses. Put large fleet trolley buses in in 1940 41. 235 buses. Well, this was taken on April 2nd, 1940, on the corner of 34th and Fremont. And here we are by one of the, one of the, one of the drivers who was a fan and a, and a photographer. And uh, to commemorate this, I went back on a special day, and we just decided to throw a big party, and everybody came out and celebrated the disappearance and commemorated the trolleys. They took their clothes off, though, for some reason. Well, you got a lot of friends. Also. I know. I one call, and they all came out. That's why I worked with this guy. Riding bicycles. But no more trolley. No more trolley. Yeah. So. We have to replace the trolley with uh, modern motor coaches. Yes. Uh, I have a question to ask this group. Uh, several women walking abreast. Yes, go. Okay. <laughs> now, what's the name of your organization? Metro Employees Historic Vehicle Association. Okay. Now, do you know the history of other groups that were interested in trolleys and like what their names were? And Maybe when some of them were around or still are? Still are. Comet. Huh? Comet. Comet? Uh, Comet, one of them. Oh, I don't know if they call them. I have the two groups. <laughs> uh, how about, here's the one I remember, was the rail fans. Rail fans are still around. But you didn't mention them when I asked. We're not organized. <laughs> we're not organized. <laughs> are they still around, the rail fans? Yeah, Somebody well, told me that, uh, that they still meet, but I haven't really known anybody in the group for a long time. Yeah. When I started studying uh, local history back in the uh, early 70s, they were a very hot group. They had a lot of really good meetings, good speakers. And then there was the North Seattle Community College. Yeah, that's right. The place was filled with people. A, a lively group it was. Okay, that's all I have to say. All right, well, this is the Go Hing celebration in 1920 uh, in Chinatown. And this whole location has not changed very much. The celebrants of this Chinese festival had a, 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 a lion dancer. You can see the costume in the background. And so to repeat it, I went into Chinatown to the Seattle Kung Fu Club, where Sifu Zhang Liang, who was 80 years old last year and was opened his, uh, his dojo in 1960 in Chinatown and taught Bruce Lee, and here he is today with his whole group. They came out in the street. I was a little worried that we, by taking over King, uh, we would offend someone, but this guy is a West Seattle cop, so he said, no problem. <laughs> and there is, and here's John, a very sprightly 80 years old, still Hopping and jumping. Here we are uh, 
looking at a lost river of Seattle. Can anyone name it? It's one of the rivers that was lost. To black. I'll give you, there you go. We fade to black. Anyway. And today, yeah, there it is. There it is. All right. I would, I'd be interested in hearing if you could tell us if you could tell us the story of the Black River. You who identified it disappeared when they lowered Lake Washington with the construction of the Ship Canal. Okay. What year was that? Yeah, 1916. Yeah. Okay. Um, Ish. That's good. That, that's the basic story. Of. Very good. In fact, if you go by the Fred Meyer down in that area, they still have those what, the popular trees that are around there that have the river turned into. That's right. Yeah. And you can still see little swamps and culverts, I'm told. And interestingly, uh, not that interesting, but I was born in the Fred Meyer automotive section. Wow, that's very interesting. <laughs> Better than the, the old Kmart. Is that an emergency delivery or something? No, it used to be Renton General. No, that's where McClendon's is. It's where McClendon's is. Right, and the old Kmart used to be. Oh, well, that's where. Okay. That was the place of my birth. So great. They're going to have a. They're going to have a little plaque there someday. <coughs> someday they'll have a plaque. Yeah, they might. Okay, so let's go forward here. We're jumping to another uh, interesting. Uh, so this is uh, Lake Union, looking southeast, and we'll look at it today with another couple kids. Here they are standing around Aloha on the other side of Westlake, right about near the same spot. And this was taken about six years ago. And here these kids are daughters of my neighbor today. Now this is John Owen's kids. He works for City Light. So he's sort of a, a cousin, a cousin. I don't think a kissing cousin, but a cousin to you guys. Apparently Lake Union was also lower during that. That much. No. Ah. Oh, the turkey roaster for Thanksgiving. The oh, turkey wow. roaster. <laughs> Never heard everybody call it that. The, so the lovely good. flying bird. That looks good, though. Silver so slow. <laughs> this is going through the locks on April 24th, 1947, and it's an excursion out from fresh to salt. Twenty years later, as you guys all know, her life was brought to a close as a ferry, and she became a crab processing plant in Kodiak, and then refloated and towed to Seattle, but we couldn't raise the money, so we, we gave up on her, and now I think there's a, a little portion of her bridge still facing the sound, so El Elliott Bay on, in West Seattle, if you want to take a look. Is that true, Coy? Over at Salty on Alki in the parking lot, the wheelhouse is out there. You can see the wheelhouse in the Columbus. So I had to go back and find an appropriate repeat. My job has been for the last couple of years to find something that would validate my existence. And so I went back and accidentally found ooh, the Turner Joy, which was decommissioned in the early 80s. Now, why? Guys, is the Turner Joy of significance to our country? Too, you know. Well, she said, "Are you a member of the transit?" <laughs> no, she's a hired professional. She's a professional. What does she care about this crap? <laughs> I don't know. She's she's making actual dosh. We're just sitting here and we can get pointing at photos. We can get part of it. Okay. All right. So, what's the significance of the Turner Joy? You guys all know this. 1964, August 2nd. August 4th. What's the significance of the Turner Joy? Something about Vietnam? Pretty close. Very good. That's good enough, yes. So there were two ships involved in the Gulf of Tonkin. Big event that got us into the Vietnam War. Yes. Uh, the, there was a skirmish with North Vietnamese gunboats and the USS Maddox. And the Tonkin, the, uh, sorry, the Turner Joy sailed to the Maddox's rescue. The two boats exchanged fire with Vietnamese gunboats. And a couple days later, um, lies were told. Fiction was created that there was another skirmish, which never happened. But on the basis of that second skirmish, we got thoroughly invested in the war. That was the Gulf of Tonkin Resolution. How many lives were lost? I mean, Fit more than 50,000. 55,000 lives? That's just Americans. Really. Any, any Vietnam vets Is here? American? 
American lives. They're and more probably a, than the other. Well, we don't even consider the Vietnamese no, lives. To, you know, just, we're not thinking about that. Um, <laughs> oh, oh, oh. All right, that's a good lesson in American history for you. And, and here is Turner Joy off the coast of Vietnam in full sail. Oh, and now we come to something we're all going to lose. What do you guys think? Are you going to miss it in any way, shape, or form? Are you going to miss this monstrosity? Yeah. Wait, yeah. wait, before you answer that, let's have Clay give a little talk about the importance of the, of the Alaska Wave Island. Clay? <laughs> We're going to lose West Seattle's and Ballard's lifeline to downtown and replace it with a tunnel that has only two lanes going each way and you can't get off downtown and you have no to pay. Entrance, and you pay no attention to the entrances and exits at each end. Right, and you have to pay for the privilege. Mm -hmm. And it's going to be chaos come February, mm -hmm. all for the idea that somehow we're going to beautify the waterfront by taking the viaduct down. Now, I disagree with him. I think we should all be punished for the stupidity of having built it in the first place, and the idea of taking it down I think is wonderful. It's smelly, it's ugly, and it gets in the way of a development that he poo-poos as somehow an improvement. Well, I think it will be an improvement. So we're all going to vote now. You've got Clay's point of view and my point of view. You in favor of Clay's, please. You want to say anything else, Clay? Yeah. Right now, the viaduct provides the best view of Seattle for rich or poor, and now it's only going to be for the you rich. Know, it's nice you get that egalitarian in there. Okay, I, I won't add any more. I think I've done sufficient uh, persuasion and description of my position. All those, Gene, you want to take a vote? No. no you, you were leading it, so go ahead. Okay. All those that uh, go with Clay and want to keep the light up, raise your hands, please. One, two, three, four. These guys don't like me, I don't I don't think he's had any personal No, I think so. I think they've sided with Clay because they can sense I'm a bully. That's probably what they do. We respectfully disagree. Do you want to keep the... Take your second vote. Well, all those in favor of uh, getting rid of it. Uh, and, uh, thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. You're obviously the most intelligent person. So, actually, I voted, voted on both si I voted on both sides of that because I have real mixed emotions about it. Um, uh, you know, because we, we hear about this traffic Armageddon that we're going to have out of it. Yeah. But, uh, we, you know, Portland went through the same thing when they tore down their uh, riverfront uh, freeway that they had running along the Willamette River. And they've got a park that's, uh, what is it, a half a block wide and it's runs. A jewel. It's a jewel. And it runs the length of, uh, uh, you know, the length of the Willamette River basically through downtown Portland. And the question is, you know, where did all that traffic go? Well, it went somewhere. But uh, the, the traffic mess worked itself out. I've always kind of felt that same way about the viaduct. Yeah. If you take it down, put a park in there, and a little bit of a parkway running along the front, um, traffic's got to go somewhere. Hmm. And it'll figure it out. Well, let's take a look at this. is before Thank the you, viaduct opened. Thank you for your votes. And, uh, this is before the viaduct opened in April of 53. And here it is just last year. And you can still see, watch Smith Tower once again. But what, what Paul and I both really enjoy, and we haven't pulled clay on this, but this is the F, now it's the F5 building. This is just as they're about to top it off. This is in spring of 17. And so we're to, to uh, but both of us actually enjoy this building. I don't like a lot of Seattle new architecture, but both of us like this one. And we, I discovered in one of our previous shows that someone mentioned that the F5 building, which was originally called the Mark, was actually modeled by the architect who, who designed it after this. Ooh. Oh, now I'm in favor of it. <laughs> <laughs> it was, he said, and in fact, as they were building it in the lobby, they had a huge portrait of Audrey Hepburn this was the picture. You can see the slant of her, of her, of her hip, as well as the slant of the of the line of the cigarette holder, 
And that's, those are the marks going down the building. That was his inspiration, was Audrey, this picture of Audrey Hepburn from uh, Breakfast at Tiffany's. <laughs> and I didn't even know that was why I liked it. But I, yeah. you know, my mother had a, looked a little bit like Audrey Hepburn. Okay. Oh, now don't, don't do that. I'll show you a picture of my mother. Oh, I see You've never seen a picture of her. Mm -hmm. Don't be a bastard. That's, I'm talking about my late mother, and you're you're groaning like, no, nah, she was a she was an ugly piece of work. No, no, his mother was a beauty. She was very talented. She looked a lot like you. What's the ground? Okay, we'll we'll rest. This is actually what Paul doesn't know is this is a picture of my mother. <laughs> okay, let's go forward. Very good. Okay, we're just going to jump right through here. This is Assel Curtis. Uh, looking down at a lake in North Seattle, and I live right around its shores. And today, that same view, we're looking at Green Lake. So that's, that's a lot of development. Yeah. Nice farm fields. In fact, as I look down my street now and look at the old maps, there's one house that was uh, that sat on that street. It was the the farmhouse around which well, it was all fields and, and wooded land. That's your crow, isn't it, cow cow? That is my crow. Yeah, I feed the crows at Green Lake, so they follow me. Okay. This is a secret. It's Seattle's oldest structure, still extant. Yeah, Seattle. It doesn't have the right wing on the wing with the window there. That's gone, but otherwise it's there. And moved, actually, one block from this position. And uh, where is it? Where is it? Alcan. Alcan, oh, that's right. On what street? Oh, I want to say like 60th. 64. 64. That's right. We'll give you awards for that. 64. So this picture was given to Paul by Ivar Hagland. And this I'm is Ivor. I remember Ivor Hagelin. Raise your hand. Sainted memory. All those who don't know who Ivor Hagelin was, raise your hand. Get out. Get out. Get out. Get out. Get out. You're done. Go on. Get out of here. You lose. You're out of here. <laughs> so there's Ivor's mom. And now I just figured it out. Well, you probably are, are better than all of them because you thought of him as Ivar, which is what his mom called him. Not oh, Ivar. Ivar. Yeah. Or, Norwegian or Swedish, that's how you pronounce that's it. That's how you pronounce I, it. Yes, mm -hmm. Ivar. So there's Ivar's mom and his extended family, and her mom, his grandmother. And uh, this house was built by Doc Maynard in the 1860s. And it's still there today. And, I, and if you go into the basement, you can find the hammer marks on the beams. And there's Clay Eels right here. He was director of the Southwest Seattle, Seattle Historical Society uh, until they kicked him out for malfeasance. He's just stole too much money from him. Gene, we forgive you though, Clay. We forgive you. He, just, he wasn't paid well, you know? He was forced into it. He, I mean, he needed the money. You can see that the wing no longer exists off to that side, but this is the original, that is the original uh, roof line. Roof line. And, uh, tasteful new windows. Tasteful new windows, yeah. And it's completely unmarked. So you have to walk down the street. There's no plaque. There's there's nothing that would tell you that this is the oldest structure in Seattle. Well, there is a block away, isn't there? Yes. A block away, there's a little sign. And it's original in, location. In the, yes, in the sidewalk on Alki Beach, along Alki Avenue. What does it say? I don't have I don't have it memorized, but it says the first the the oldest house blah blah blah. Does it say walk down the block and you'll see it? Princess Angela. Yes, Chief Seattle. I'll have to go look again. I don't remember. Also known as Kiki Soblo. Who named her Princess Angela? Where'd she get that name? You just heard Yesler. Not Yesler. Some gringo. It was a gringo. Yes, but it was the wife of Doc Maynard, Catherine Maynard. And Doc had such a close relationship with the natives, they, 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 the rest of the, uh, of the pioneers hated his guts. So no, not the rest of yeah. them. Sure. A lot of them did. So he moved to West Seattle to get away from them. 
I'll read you Paul's article. He might have changed his mind. Well, wasn't he also the first town drunk to uh, painter? Is what it's well, by Dylan I don't know if he was how much of a drunk he was. Uh, but all of them like booze. Yeah, just right. They all, yeah. Except those made. that belong to the Methodist Church. So from Paul's original column, the Maynards escaped to West Seattle to grow a garden and escape the resentment of Seattle settlers who thought Doc was too kind to Native Americans. I should have said those Seattle settlers. No, you should have been more specific. Yeah. So uh, he was branded a kind of a, uh, an Indian lover, and uh, his wife, Catherine, was uh, particularly close to Kiki Soglu, the daughter of Chief Seattle. And about a year ago, Ron Edge, who, who works with Paul uh, and me and Clay a lot. Let's ask now. Go ahead, keep going. Go ahead. Found the location of Princess Angeline's shack, which we knew was below the market, below Western, but it had never been really triangulated to an exact location until Ron, by a, with a combination of uh, photographs, triangulated and found. He was a Boeing engineer, so he was a very effective. Wasn't he? No. He was a mechanic. He was more into the computers. So he was not a trained engineer. He ran the computers in one of the offices. Huh. Not an engineer. But he has the head of an engineer. Go ahead. So Ron found the location, and here he is sitting in the only open air spot below the market. There's the Pike Place Market Garage, and there's the Fixed Medor building, and there's Ron Edge, who is not a Boeing engineer, though he keeps keep hearing he's a Boeing engineer. I try to promote him as a Boeing engineer. He objects. So we can continue to do it, but he'll object. Okay, but he's not here. Well, that's why I had to tell the truth. Oh, okay. So, onward, Ron is sitting in the same, right about the porch of Princess Angeline. Now, this is the last portion, the last slide of our show, and there she is, sitting in, uh, on Pike Street, where in 1890, where now where the market is, it's Post Alley, and we have the one inset of her father, Chief Seattle, the single photograph that's taken of him. And painters uh, would uh, several times would paint this photo, but they would paint it with his eyes open because in this particular photo, his eyes are closed. So there he is sitting next to his daughter. He's in a studio. She's in the market, what is today the market. We went back with two descendants of both of them, descendant of Kiki Soglu, Princess Angeline, who is Mary Lou Slaughter, who is the great-great-great-great-granddaughter of Princess Angeline, and Ken Workman, who is the great-great-great-grandson of uh, Chief Seattle via his second wife. And here they are in pretty much the same spot. How many of you have got two wives? That's all right. Clay, Clay has said, do you want to tell us about that, Clay? Go ahead, Clay, tell us about it. We got Ken and Mary Lou up here. So Ken and Mary Lou, and Mary Lou, take a gander at Mary Lou, she is another 80-year-old. Shames me. She doesn't look 80 at all. She looks about 45. Yeah. Yeah. Well, she's 80. She's also, also one of the uh, most uh, skilled and notable basket makers. Uh, and she made the, uh, these magnificent uh, capes and the vest. And in the next slide you'll see she made for Ken, she had him, they're both wearing the, uh, the cedar hats that she makes. And she sells these for many thousands of dollars because they're, they're cunningly made and she does it with love. Really? Thousands of dollars for a hat? Yes. Where does she sell them? Uh, I don't know. <clears throat> but she sells them all around. Uh, she sold a basket to uh, um, uh, Vi Hilbert, another very well-known linguist and uh, Salish tribe member, who for, uh, for $3,000, a little woven cedar basket. She's, anyway, her, her skills are tremendous. While we were standing there, and taking this photo, Ken turned around 
a couple times. And afterwards, I asked him, Ken, why, what were you looking at? He said, well, while we were taking the photo, someone tapped me on my arm. And he reached over and did a little tap, tap. And I said, well, Clay didn't see it. I didn't see it. And Paul doesn't believe it. <laughs> so we'll leave it up to you guys to decide whether he was tapped by a relative or he just had a little twitch of early Parkinson's. We're not going to take a vote on that because I lost it the last time. <laughs> Gene, anyway. Gene, you said he was touched by, by history. Yes. So for me, it was the nudge of history. That sounds better. Mm -hmm. Touched by history. You know that, that series with the Bonanza star, Touched by an Angel? Wasn't that what it was called? No, remember that. No. That's going to be the title of your next book. Touched by an Angel. Thank you very much. Oh, yeah. since, you're, since you're titling them, that could very well be the truth. <laughs> And here, you remember that French photographer that we showed you earlier? She took this photo of Paul up on gas, up on Kite, uh, Kite Hill. Hill. Yeah. yeah. In 2011. And that's it. Okay, guys uh, and girls, uh, gal. I mean, uh, we want to hear an applause from you. Today. <laughs> Somebody's actually, Someone's actually fine. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Do you want it there or do you want it right here? Okay. Right there. Okay. Do okay. you want to say two to anybody? No. That's a long time. There was never a problem. See, see, bro. I know you're quite right. He's all. Not let that go away too fast. You. To me, I'm Doug. If you'd like, if you would like copies, I'm happy to forward anything you'd like. Well, that, the Bert, Doug, the Bert bash on one, right? It's right there. there. Okay. So. That's, uh, I'm, I'm from Bash on Island. We have a, uh, a group on Facebook that's got hundreds of people involved in Bash on if you, if you give me your card or something, I'll just, I'll send, I'll send that one in particular to you. Anyone else with your card? Or just an email there. I love this one, Seattle Sightseeing. Circle sightseeing. So it's good for about Thank another you, month and a half. And the Burton Bash on that. Actually, we can. Okay. You're the first. Yes, yeah. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll send this off. Probably in the What's next your name? day Josh. or so. Can I Thank you. Made it up to you? Sure. And Clay, you're in this too. Yeah. Okay. I'd be happy to sign you if you want. Add you to the collection here. Absolutely. Each signature President. devalues it by about a nickel. Yeah. Oh, that's Sweet. Fine. For <laughs> you, you want your card? Uh, yes. Absolutely. Give me the name of the institution. It's for by MHBA. Primo. Nice and cold, Tim. Store down. All day. H. This was like, especially in the 80s, yeah, 80s and early 90s, when I was talking yeah. the Seattle Times board, yeah. the okay. New York Victoria was actually uh, like that, uh, with that in the back, that is something I was after every time. Absolutely. But they had, at the time, they had six. There you go. Thank you. Actually, that's a little day. Congratulations. Thank you very yeah. much. Yeah. For 37 years, just around the corner. Which was three years. Yeah. This is a makes me real good. Can I have it? Can I have it? I'm almost wondering though, when you look at some of the early pictures from the thing, no, really want to be. If you shouldn't do a then and now and again column. Well, it's it's sort of. Okay, who's this? Oh, I can it's, sign. I, it's, yeah. it's now, I and then, and so on. Yeah. Some prejudice against <laughs> signing. I make Paul sign my name. Oh, Richard, okay. Yeah. Oh, where did I put my... Usually we get some... It's like other medication. Oh, you see it? It's like other medication. I'm not taking it. I'll grab it. Yeah. I even got my drawing handle. Uh, 
Seattle Times, uh, Sketcher. Okay. Yes. Oh, there's, the primo. Yeah, there's, there's a couple of very sketch some of our historic buses, and they're, I'm sitting there behind the wheel of it. So. Yep. That, that's nice guy. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Are you signing or are you in line? Uh, I'm waiting for a thing here. Okay. You're okay. signing also, sir? I could. I'm not oh, sure why not. Buddy on this. You okay, I don't need to feel left out. Come here, man. Josh. There you go. You're the head of this. We're, We're all here. Good. Good. Yeah, Thank you. Thank you. Oh, I got one more here. Some department. Did you want these or you want me to take them with me and I can bring them back next time? You can bring them every time. That's or fine. Or give you that. <laughs> Thank you. Good to see you again. Thank you. We really appreciate yeah, it. Oh, sure. Unfortunately, do the I see that work. Nicely done. All the members are working in a job that's 24 7, that it's hard to get it. No. It's hard to get a time where everybody's yeah. available. Oh, it's impossible. It's impossible. Mm -hmm. It's not difficult, it's impossible. Found the page. Oh, great. But You're going to want to get uh, Gene's signature because yeah. later so on, no, That's what's going to make this really value. Appreciate. I I had that fixed. Oh, is that, that is that what's going to make yeah. this value? Yeah, we may as well. While you've got your pen, ten or twenty. You know, as soon as I get enough, all huh? signatures. Ten or twenty. Here, 